بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ایم ڈاکٹر محب اللہ وزیر اینڈ دا ٹاپک از دی ڈسکرپشن آف ایکسٹریسا گروپ آف دی مسلز آف دا فور آم اوکے جسٹ سی وی لوک اوور ہیئر دی ایکسٹریسا گروپ کنسسٹ آف بریکیو ریڈیلس اینڈ دین ایکسٹریسر کرپائی ریڈیلس لانگس اینڈ دین ایکسٹریسر کرپائی ریڈیلس بریویس اینڈ دین کم آن دا پوسٹیئر سرفیس You, this is extensor digitorum and this is extensor digiti minimi and this is extensor carpi ulnaris and this small muscle this is enconius is it clear in the view this is enconius this in the first lecture i have discussed in detail now we discuss the description origin insertion and action in detail okay now look at the lateral border you see these three muscles brachioradialis extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis note look look this is medial supracondylar ridge and that is lateral supracondylar ridge and this is the lateral epicondyle look out of these three muscles the brachioradialis originate from the upper part of lateral supracondylar ridge and extensor carpi radialis longus originate from the lower part of lateral supracondylar ridge while the extensor carpi radialis brevis it originate from the common extensor origin from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus okay now look at the brachio radialis this muscle it originate from the lateral epicondyle from the lateral supracondylar ridge and then descend downward edge to edge with the extensor carpi radialis longus and comes over here on the lateral surface on the lateral side of the forearm over here the tendon of the brachio radialis and extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis these are overlapped by the tendon of abductor pallis longus and accessor pallis brevis this is one important relation while medial to it and overlapped by this brachioradialis you can see over here is this radial artery and the superficial branch of radial nerve okay then this brachioradialis being overlapped by this tendon it is being inserted note over here it is inserted at the lateral surface of the stylet process of the radius over here it does not cross the wrist but over here originating from the lateral supracondylar ridge it crosses the elbow and note the point that it is extensor muscle but it lies anterior to the elbow that's why its action is to flex the elbow it is extensor but being in position anterior to the elbow that's why it is flexor of the elbow and weak flexor and its important part is that its flexion is more important while the forearm is in the mid prone position in this very time the brachioradialis is the flexor okay and then posterior later to that this muscle extensor carpi radialis longus this muscle again originate from the lower part of lateral supracondylar ridge and then it lies look edge to edge with the brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus brevis and then the two tendons over here reaches and you can see these are being crossed by abductor pallis longus and extensor pallis brevis and then the tendon of extensor carpi radialis longus it comes over here by passing deep to these two tendons and is being attached note the point and is being attached to the base on the dorsal surface of the second metacarpal bone and to the base on the dorsal surface of the third metacarpal bone is inserted a extensor carpi radialis brevis over here these two muscles 
to the base and the dorsal second extensor corpus des longus where to the base and the dorsal surface of the third extensor corpus radialis brevis and at the same time note one point date on the palmar surface of the base of the second and third metacarpal bone over here is a taste the flexor carpi radialis while on the dorsal surface over here is a taste extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis mean that the flexor carpi radialis is the equivalent of the two muscles extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis okay and now the third muscle the extensor carpi radialis brevis this three muscle which lies over here this one originate from the common extensor origin from the lateral epicondyle and again it passes along with the other two and its tendon being overlapped by the tendon of abductor pallus and extensor pallus brevis and it is being as i told you inserted onto the base of the second and third the, the third metacarpal bone and now note the point that look that the brachioradialis is being inserted to the lateral surface of tight palatus of radius while the carpi radialis longus and brevis these are attached to the posterior surface of the base of the second and third metacarpal bone so these two muscles must be having action at the wrist joint and at the wrist joint these two muscles these are lying posterior to the wrist that's why it the action of the carpi radialis longus and brevis is because it comes in the posterior surface it simply extend the wrist but at the same time coming over here lying at the lateral side it can radial abduct as well note the point these two muscles lies on the radial side of the wrist joint and then it crosses posterior to the wrist joint that's why its action is number 1 abduction or radial abduction and number 2 extension of the wrist okay but note the important action or function of the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis is at the time when you when when you want to make a powerful fist at this very time when the flexors act at the digits to make a powerful fist the wrist joint must be stabilized so at this time the flexor carpi radialis and the two extensors extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis these two groups and tagomas group flexor and extensor they act synergistically with one another to stabilize the wrist joint and it is the most important function of the extensor carpi radialis longus brevis and flexor carpi radialis in synergism with one another and the main prime function is to abduct and extend secondly you look this muscle because it lies over here at the border that's why if there is paralysis of the flexor group of muscles these muscles especially the brachioradialis can easily be transplanted to the flexor group okay all right then the nerve supply of these three muscles note the point this three muscle is the radial nerve and note again okay you remove these muscles and look over here this is the radial nerve the radial nerve gives two branches over here to the brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus then the radial nerve divides into two the superficial branch and deep branch the deep branch which is also called as posterior interosseous nerve that is the, actually the continuation of the radial nerve it now gives two branches one to the extensor carpi radialis brevis and one to the superior so the brachioradialis and longus are being supplied by direct branch of the radial nerve while the extensor carpi radialis brevis is supplied by a branch from the posterior interosseous nerve which is also the continuation of the radial nerve okay then 
you come to the posterior side look over here again you can see h to h with the excessor carparadialis brevis h to h with that now you can see this muscle excessor digitorum excessor digiti minimi make it clear and excessor carpi and there is this three muscles these muscles have a common origin you can see by a common tendon from a facet on the anterior surface of the lateral epicondyle. Accessor digitorum, accessor digiti minimi, and accessor carpi unlaris. These muscles, these three, and this three, and one this and conius, this is combinedly the superficial group of accessor muscles. Now, this extensor digitorum, look, it originates from this lateral epicondyle, from the facet and the anterior surface of lateral epicondyle. You can see this lateral epicondyle. And then descend downward, edge to edge with the extensor carparadialis brevis and extensor digiti minimi. And look over here, and look over here. Over here is the extensor retinal column, which they have not shown. This you can see. Look. This is the extensor retinal column. And all these tendons, you can see, it passes deep to the extensor retinal column. This is the column. So, over here, this extensor digitorum, it divides into four tendons. To the lateral four fingers, one tendon to the index, one to the middle, one to the ring, and one to the little finger. Accessor digitorum divides into four tendons. Now note this point that this accessor digitorum tendon passes toward the digits. And these tendons, you can see it over here, make it close. These tendons are united with one another by slips. The tendons of the digitorum are united by one to one another by slips. And then look, when this tendon now make it close, when this tendon, each tendon, it crosses the metacarpophalangeal joint. Over here you can see this triangular sheet, this triangular sheet, make it close and clear. This is called as extensor expansion are also called as extensor hood. The base of this triangular expansion are extensor, it is proximal, while the apex of it is distal. This each extensor tendon, it passes to be attached or to reach or to become continuous with this triangular extensor expansion. To the margins of this triangular expansion from the front Coming over here, attached to this margin of this extensor hood, or extensor expansion, are attached the lumbricals and interosseae, which are coming from the palmar side. And these lumbricals and interosseae, which are being attached over here to this lateral margin of this extensor expansion, these are called as wing tendons. Wing tendons are the attached tendons of the lumbricals and interosseae. And then this extensor expansion, which is triangular, apex is distally over here at the distal part of the proximal phalanx. It divides into three slips, which they have not shown. Okay, look, this divides over here, over here into three slips. In the intermediate slip, look, you can see the tendon after joining this triangle, it divides into it divides into three slips, the intermediate slips and two collateral slips. The intermediate slip is being attached over here at the dorsum of the base of the middle phalanx over here. At the dorsum of the base of the middle phalanx, where the two collateral slips that comes over here and then reunite with one another, 
reunite with her and are being attached over here you look at the base of the distal pharynx make it clear so each tendon after joining this accessory expansion passes distally and divides into three slits the intermediate and two collateral the intermediate slit is being attached over here at the dorsum of the base of the middle phalanx while the two collateral slits come distally and reunite and is being attached over here to the dorsum of the base of the distal phalanx okay this is the mode of insertion of accessor digitorum that's why because it is attached to the distal phalanx and then to the middle phalanx and it lies posterior to the metacarpophalangeal joint so all these joints are being extended by accessor digitorum and then secondarily it also extends the wrist joint so this way accessor digitorum it acts at the lateral four digits and it extends the distal phalanx the middle phalanx the metacarpophalangeal joint and the wrist joint this is the accessor digitorum and its nerve supply is the, the posterior interosseous nerve and you know the posterior interosseous nerve after supplying the supinator it passes between the two heads of supinator to come onto the posterior surface along with the posterior interosseous artery i will show when i remove the superficial growth then later to that you can see this small muscle that is accessor digiti minimi this accessor digiti minimi this muscle originate again from this common accessor origin from the lateral epicondyle and may take some strip from the nearby fascia and lie look edge to edge with the accessor digitorum seems to be the part of accessor digitorum okay and then it comes over here and separate from the tendon of accessor digitorum and it passes towards it passes towards the little finger a little two being connected to the four tendon of accessor digitorum this is the four tendon the two are connected with one another and these two combined tendons then passes on the dorsum of the proximal phalanx and then it joins the accessor hold and accessor expansion and the insertion is the same as the other tendons at the accessor digitorum that is the middle slip to the middle phalanx and the two collateral slips to the distal phalanx you make it close look at close look this look this is the middle slip and these two you can see these are the collateral slips this one and this one the two collateral slip attached to the base of the distal phalanx while the, this is the middle slip look that one which is attached to the base of the middle phalanx and this one to the base of the distal phalanx so the accessor digiti minimi it acts like the tendon of the other accessor digitorum and it extends the, the the joints of the little finger and it can also extend this this joint then the last muscle of this group is the the accessor carpi ulnaris look over here this is accessor carpi ulnaris this is flexor carpi ulnaris and this you can see over here this is the posterior subcutaneous border of ulna which you can feel in your own as well this posterior subcutaneous border of ulna look look this the the accessor carpi ulnaris look it originates again from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle of humerus by common tendon and then it passes distally look over here this is flex, flexor carpi this is accessor carpi over here to the posterior border is attached one fascia like this from the ventral surface of the fascia from the ventral surface of the fascia originate the flexor carpi ulnaris and from the dorsal surface of the fascia originate the accessor carpi ulnaris in this way the 
extracellular carpi alares after originating from the lateral epicondyle then it is being attached it takes its origin by a common fascia from the posterior border of ulna which is being common to the extracellular carpi alares and the flexor carpi alares then you can see this tendon then passes distally and over here look it is attached to the base of the dorsal muscle the fifth metacarpal bone it doesn't reach to the digits the flexor carpi alares is also being attached over here to the metacarpal it doesn't reach to the digits so this can extend the wrist joint and it can also it it can also red um, medially abduct the wrist joint look this both look over here is the flexor carpi alares over here and over here is the extracellular carpi alares when this flexor carpi alares contract it flex and medially adduct when the extracellular carpi alares contract it extend and medially adduct but when both of them contract the flexor and extensor they neither flex nor extend but they stabilize the wrist joint over here lies both the, look over here lies the flexor carpi alares and over here lies you can see this is extracellular carpi alares both are attached to the fifth metacarpal bone one on the ventral surface one on the dorsal surface when the flexor contract it flex and adduct when the extracellular contract it extend and adduct but when both contract note this important point when both contract the flexion and extension action of one another is being cancelled rather the act synergistically just to stabilize the wrist joint so that the long flexor can act properly at the distal phalanges to make a proper fist this action of the extracellular carpi alares and flexor carpi alares and flexor carpi radialis and extracellular digitorum longus brevis in the important function to stabilize the wrist joint during fist formation or to make grip okay this extracellular carpi alares can also be transplanted on to the the, the anterior surface or to the flexor compartment if paralyzed now all these muscles that is extracellular digitorum extracellular digiti and extracellular carpi alares it is being supplied by this posterior interosseous nerve which is a continuation of the radial nerve which passes look you can see this supinator it comes by passing between the two heads of supinator then the last small muscle of this superficial group you can see make it close this small triangular muscle which is the enconius this enconius muscle you can see it originate it originate look again from the lateral epicondyle and then it passes from the lateral epicondyle it passes medially it passes medially to be attached look to be attached to this lateral surface of the olecranon process and upper part of the ulna it comes like this and note the point that coming from this up to this when it contracts it will draw the head of the ulna posterior laterally during the during the pronation it abduct the upper end of the ulna from medial to lateral a small amount possible abduction at this part during pronation so it help the pronator muscles by withdrawing the upper end of the ulna posterior laterally or abducting it but note the point this enconius muscle lying over here but it is supplied by radial nerve while the radial nerve lying over here in the radial groove look while the radial nerve lying over here in the radial groove it gives one branch to the medial head of triceps after supplying the medial head of triceps this branch descends downward to supply the enconius over here not the point the branch of the enconius is given by the radial nerve while the radial nerve lies over here in the posterior compartment of the arm in the radial groove over here okay this is the superficial group of flexor muscles and i hope it would be clear to you thank you very much